Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to present a project that we here at INSS are calling Israel Challenges and Opportunities 2030. At the outset, I want to thank our core project team, whose names you see uh, beside me, and also, as well, Gilad Sher and Liran Antebi, who has all, have also helped us in a number of our meetings. During my presentation today, I'm first going to tell you a little bit about what our project is about and about its goals. Then I'll tell you a bit about our main findings, then our interim recommendations, and then I'll briefly close. The American icon Yogi Berra once said, as only he could, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. The good news is that in this project, making predictions is not really our core goal. On the one hand, in order to be saying anything meaningful about 2030, we have to make some assumptions and some ideas about what 2030 will look like, based on the best literature in the field. But that's not where we are headed. That's not really our goal. Our goal instead is to look at different types of scenarios, and from those scenarios to draw out the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for Israel. And more importantly, based on those challenges and opportunities, to develop recommendations, concrete, specific, actionable recommendations of things that can be done now, whether by the government or by the NGO sector, to meet these challenges and to take advantage of these opportunities. Before I go into our findings, I want to make three points, three caveats. First of all, this project and this presentation specifically focuses on external issues, issues across our borders. There's no question, especially after having listened to Nadia, that the internal issues facing Israel are critically important. But for purposes of this presentation, we'll focus on the external ones. The second important thing to note is that this is an ongoing project. We're still hard at work, and these are only our interim views and our interim recommendations. We still have a ways to go, and we'll be continuing to be at work. And the third and final point, these are highlights only and selected highlights mainly to be consistent with the type of recommendations and to explain the basis for the recommendations that I'll put forward towards the end. First, I'd like to point out a few key trends that the best literature in the field and the best experts say are those that are heading, we're heading towards in 2030. And the good news is you recognize a number of them from th that were spoken about from this podium during the course of the conference. First of all, the rise of Asia. We've all heard a lot about it. We talk about it all the time, but I still think sometimes we fail to understand its scope. Between 1 billion and 2 billion people are about to enter the middle class, a historic achievement, and the vast majority of them are in Asia. What this means is that the world's economic center of gravity, the markets, the consumers, are going to be in Asia. And with it, the geopolitical weight of the world will move eastward as well. We don't know exactly what the political configuration is going to be. There are lots of unknowns. But we do know with relative certainty that Asia is on the rise. The second key trend is the rise of non-state actors, another trend we're familiar with. These non-state actors include not only non-state armed groups, like the one pictured on the slide, but also NGOs, also the private sector and also the importance of public opinion as individuals are empowered through information technology and as societies change. We've seen, this, particularly in the Middle East, the weakening of central state government governance, as we heard from General Kochavi earlier today. And these trends are important not only in the security sphere, but the diplomatic sphere as well. Next, the idea of a multipolar world with Asia's rise, with the movement of the geopolitical weight of the world eastward, the United States will still, is still likely to remain the world's most powerful country, but it won't return to be the hegemon it was in the 1950s. We've heard about China's rise from Yoram earlier. Europe will remain powerful, or at least a powerful economic market, and Russia, despite serious challenges, has the potential to be a force in world affairs, and India, especially towards the end of the period, as well. Next, the diffusion of technology. As technology becomes cheaper, individuals and smaller and smaller groups of people have more access to it, whether that be information technology or whether that be military technology. This, too, has important effects for Israel and for our national security. And finally, increased demand for food, water, and energy. This is for two main reasons. 
First of all, population is growing. But more importantly, the middle class is growing. This means that there's more demand for meat, people are eating better, and consuming more energy. This doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be shortages and famines, but it does mean that there's going to be potentially, or even likely, an increased demand for the type of technology that can help these countries meet these needs. And again, these needs are primarily in Asia, though also potentially in the Middle East and especially North Africa, potentially because of the impact of climate change. Now I'd like to sketch out a few key unknowns. These are factors whose outcome we know will be important for the future of Israel's national security, but whose outcome is unknown. By their nature, these are things that are hard to predict. First of all, in our reg region, the Middle East that's famously unstable and unpredictable, moving counterclockwise from the upper left, the future of the Gulf monarchies, the political future of Iran, attitudes toward religion and nationalism, and what impact the Egyptian economy will have on Egypt's stability as a main determinant of Egypt's political future, especially over a long time period. And then around the world, will the United States continue to roll up its flag, especially in the Middle East? We really don't know, and that's because this is a function mainly, one, of social trends inside the United States, impossible to predict, and two, the shale revolution. And even though, as we heard from General Petraeus yesterday, the shale revolution has latched up some incredible successes, there are still question marks over it for the 2030 time frame. And then the other unknown is the standing of Israel in world public opinion, particularly in Europe and in Asia, a subject that Einav spoke about earlier. Now how to act. What are our interim thoughts on the types of recommendations and programs that Israel's government and our NGO sector and our pro-Israel and our supporters abroad can put into effect to help meet these challenges and take advantage of the opportunities? First of all, outreach to Asia. As I mentioned earlier, there are two of the key trends are the rise of Asia and the empowerment of the individual in public opinion. Put them together and you see the potential importance of public opinion in Asia, especially as a billion people enter the middle class and become more politically active. What this means is that Israel and its government and our supporters abroad and the NGO sector can step up our efforts to help shape public opinion in the part of the world where many people are less familiar with us and have less preconceived and fewer preconceived notions. For example, there is a network of pro-Israel groups and campuses throughout the United States. What about something similar in India, if that's the appropriate type of network for the country? What about twin cities in places like Burma and Vietnam, two other countries on the rise? These are programs that take a lot of money, a lot of personnel, and most importantly, a lot of time, which is where long-range strategic planning and implementing long-term solutions can really make a difference. Now, one point of note, We've put an American flag in the lower right-hand corner, and that's no accident. Outreach to Asia should not come at the expense of the U.S.-Israel relationship, and we believe need not do so. The U.S. will remain the world's most powerful country, is highly likely to do so, and our relationship with the United States is incredibly important. Next, investment in food, water, and energy technologies. As I mentioned before, there is going, we're expecting higher demand for food, water, and energy. And the good news here is Israel is already a leader in many of these fields, especially water technology and agriculture. We're well placed to take advantage of this and to be, able to be there to meet the needs of places like India, China, and other parts of Asia, and even in the Middle East and the Arab world, when they confront these challenges. We've seen the impact of IT and of the startup nation over the last 10 or 20 years. Now it may be time for Startup Nation 2.0, to focus on these areas, and also urbanization as cities grow dramatically throughout the world and need security systems and management systems that Israeli technology can provide. The Prime Minister mentioned the importance of cybersecurity, and this is another potential area where Israel can take advantage of the future by investing early, investing today, and increasing our efforts so that we're there in 2030 and before then to take advantage of the opportunities. Two other recommendations to go through very briefly. First of all, building regional ties through technology and natural gas. We've already started to see the sales of natural gas to the Palestinians and can do so to others of our neighbors as well. 
We can also use technology, whether it be information technology or food, water, energy technology, to help our neighbors. And finally, stabilizing relations with the Palestinians. We talk about this in Israel plenty, so there's really no need to elaborate further than that. Finally, to conclude briefly, we believe that long-range planning is important because sometimes the solutions and the ways of taking advantage of the opportunities also take a long time to implement. The future is dynamic, but it's full of different challenges and opportunities for us to meet. And on that note, our project will be continuing our work through the coming months and the coming year, and we look forward to updating you further. Thank you.